This is Audible. The Terran Gambit. Episode 1 of the Pax Humana Saga. Written by Andy Webb. Narrated by Greg Tremblay. 1. Seven seconds to impact, yelled the frantic gunner, but the pilot held his firm grip on the controls. There was only one fighter flying away intact from this game of chicken, and Jacob Mercer would be damned if it were the enemy Corsican's bird. Jake, they're not pulling away. If we hit them, we're all goners. Explain it to them. Jacob held the enemy fighter locked in his sights. The ship still only appeared as a tiny dot, nearly washed out by the shimmering blue atmosphere far below, but it grew quickly larger, and streaks of ion beams erupted from it, shooting straight at their own fighter. He gripped the controls, and veered left to right to avoid the fire, but held his course straight at the other ship, unshaken by the deadly onslaught. At the edge of his awareness he heard klaxons indicating several hits by the enemy ion beams, an answering gunfire erupted from his own ship's guns, but he did not pay them any attention. The guns didn't matter. The klaxons didn't matter. All that mattered was winning this showdown. He would not blink. He would not yield to the Empire. He would not lose this fight, damn it. Three seconds, yelled Kit, Jake's frazzled gunner. He held his breath and wanted to close his eyes, but he didn't take his gaze off of the enemy ship, now looming large through the front viewport. Ramming the gravitic accelerator, he began a full-throated battle cry. Kit winced. One sec— He gasped. Oh, they pulled off, he said unnecessarily, as Jake was already yanking up on the controls. In one fluid motion— their fighter flipped 180 degrees from its previous course, and Jake blasted the gravitic drive to full power, effectively reversing course in less than a second. The gravitic field, of course, accelerated all parts of the ship, and every cell and molecule of their bodies at the same rate, so they felt no g-forces, but it was disorienting all the same. Kit, go! Jake yelled. The gunner squeezed his trigger and let out a deep sigh of relief as it exploded into a brief fireball, extinguished soon after by the near vacuum of the upper atmosphere. Bastards, Jake muttered. Nice shot, Rooster. Kit glared sidelong at him. He had finally stopped objecting to the call sign his squad mates had dubbed him with. Nice flying, I think. Hey, how about not doing that again? Jake grinned but ignored the request. Any more contacts? The gunner glanced down at the sensor readout. Yeah, about twenty more bogies between us and Liberty Station. The rest of Viper Squadron engaged. All around the fighter the space battle raged, bright blue shafts indicating the ion beam fire from the fleet of Corsican Empire ships, punctuated with staccato bursts of red from the smaller Resistance fighters. But this time the Resistance was not so outnumbered. This time they had the advantage. This time they would win, and kick New Rome with its Pax Humana off the planet and back to the cesspool of a world they came from. Jake keyed in a new course and sped the fighter around toward the shipyards to join his squadron. Leaning into the cockpit window at his right, Lieutenant Mercer peered down at the earth. Far below, he could make out the Florida Peninsula, mottled green and blue with everglades and water. Squinting down at the tip, he tried to make out Miami, searching for smoke, but he knew they were unlikely to see it from this altitude. Did any bogies make it through? Kit asked. I don't think so. We'd probably have seen some smoke plumes over the base in Miami by now if one had, either from their bombs or the base's ion cannon blasting them out of the sky. Right. Kit muttered before glancing at his readout. Contact, three o'clock and up. The man pointed above Jake's head. On it. The craft veered to the right and away from Earth, closing like a dart on its next unlucky target. With the help of a few simple maneuvers by Mercer, Kit dispatched the Imperial Corsican fighter with a single burst. Yeah, baby! Kit said, reaching over to slap his friend on the helmet. Jake smiled and gunned the engine to point back toward the shipyards, their original target that day. 
The uprising was only in its second week, but already the resistance had captured most of the key imperial installations on the surface, with only a few holdouts in Asia, and was now working its way through all of the remaining military targets in order. Two orbital defense platforms had fallen into resistance hands the day before, but the linchpin to the orbital space over the Earth was the shipyards, Liberty Station. Without it, the Empire would suffer a huge strategic loss in the Terran system, leaving them only a few outer solar system outposts, posts which the Resistance would easily take once the major battles were won. Mars, of course, had fallen back to the Resistance within the first few hours of the uprising. Those hardened colonists had never taken guff from anyone, and Jake supposed the Empire boys never knew what hit them there. What's the status on the disruptor field kit? We'll never be able to get the landing parties on there if it's still in place. Scotting, the other man said. He furrowed his still youthful brow and studied his console before blowing out an exasperated breath. Gah, still up, he said, and added. Contact, right behind us. Roger. Jake dove the fighter straight down toward the atmosphere, weaving around the falling wreckage of broken ships and debris trusting that the superior maneuverability of their craft would permit them to outfox their pursuer and then charge it from a more favorable vector. Ah, still on us. Kit started to reach for the comm. He's good. I'm calling back up. No need, said Jake, grunting as he flipped the ship around a particularly large piece of debris, probably from one of the larger capital ships that had exploded earlier. He couldn't tell if it was Terran or Corsican. The gunner ignored him, this is Viper 6 requesting assistance. Repeat, Viper 6, request assistance. A garbled voice came over the comm. Viper 6, Viper 2, looks like you've got yourselves a tail, rooster. Yeah, looks like it, Crash. The voice laughed. I'm there in five, don't go nowhere. Roger, said Kit. Lieutenant Mercer glanced behind him out the side of the cockpit and noticed the other fighter weaving behind, matching his own flight pattern and closing in. Crash, where are you, man? You'll be here in a second, shotgun. Hold us on till then. Jake grunted. <clears throat> Trying. He weaved this way and that through the cluttered debris field, praying he didn't slam them into a small piece of junk that didn't show up on the sensors. At their speed, even a stray bolt would tear through the cabin. Bright blue flashes illuminated their faces, and Jake swore. The enemy ion beams packed a lot of punch and could nearly blind the eyes if stared at for too long. The calm crackled. hee Red bursts replaced the blue beams around them, and Jake could almost swear he heard an explosion far behind them in the blackness of space. An illusion, of course. But it heartened him all the same to look back and see the expanding debris field of their former pursuer. Oh, thanks, Crash, said Jake. No problem, shotgun. A hoop from Kit made Jake snap his head around, looking for the next bogey. What? It's down! Disruptor field's down! Good. Time to escort the boarding ships and take back their world once and for all. Laying in a approach vector to the Fury. He looked out the window and spied a distant gray dot in an even higher orbit, looking more like a flea than a massive capital ship. The boarding parties would be disembarking now, and the enemy fighters would swarm them like angry bees, that is, those that were left, and he grinned at the husks of enemy fighters still falling, blazing through the atmosphere. He pushed the gravitic accelerator to maximum and saw the speed indicator shoot up past 11 kps. Nearly escape velocity, he noted. The comm jolted his attention back to the cabin. Viper squad, Viper leader, commence escort plan, pair up. Viper 9 on me since Viper 10 is gone. Jake swore again. Kurt was dead. And his gunner... He couldn't even remember her name, she was so new. Too many friends had left that day, too many loved ones. But it would all be over soon. Victory was near. As their craft decelerated, the field of battle snapped into view. The Fury, the rebels' main capital ship occupied the center of an angry swarm of enemy fighters. A screen of defensive fire blazed off of the massive vessel, suppressing enemy movement toward the main shuttle bays on the starboard side. An occasional unlucky Corsican ship 
burst into a brief fireball every now and then, caught between the anvil of a defensive screen and the hammer of a small armada of resistance fighters now pressuring them. Crash, are you still with us? Sure am, shotgun. The voice responded through the comm. On me, our charge is leaving the fury now. Kit pointed out the front viewport. There, she's coming out. Jake nodded and glanced all around, to ensure no enemy fighters had marked the bloated troop carrier now sailing gracefully out the shuttle bay doors. All clear, troop carrier four, Viper six, you are cleared for approach to Liberty Station. Look sharp, said Jake into the comm. The commander of the troop carrier responded. Roger that, Viper six. You and Rooster just keep the bastards off us for twenty seconds. We'll do the rest. The voice over the speaker laughed as someone next to him said something inaudible. Uh, what was that? Jake said. Uh, nothing. <laughs> Just Sergeant Warner here making a funny about your gunner. Something about nailing the Corsicans with his giant cock. Thank you, Troop 4, Viper 6 out, said Kit, cutting off the comm with a scowl on his face. What? Jake grinned, knowing he was about to be chewed out yet again for the moniker, Rooster. Kit thumbed his trigger anxiously, scanning the space around the troop carrier that they now flanked. I am never forgiving you for that call sign. Hey, it's your fault for getting drunk off your ass in that dingy joint and then whipping it out for all the world to see. And you should have seen the look on... Kit interrupted him. Contact, nine o'clock and Z plus seven hundred meters, closing fast. Got it. Jake pulled up on the controls. Crash, stay with the carrier. Roger, shotgun, said the voice over the comm. The fighter peeled up, away from the carrier and toward the fury hovering in space behind them, rail guns and laser turrets still blazing away at the swarms of fighters. Ah, uh, let it go, shotgun. He's trying to draw us away from the carrier. Let Hornet Squad handle it. Jake grumbled, but steered the nose back to the boarding ship and pulled out ahead of her. Is it coming back? Negative, said Kit. New contact, though, straight ahead. He leaned forward and peered at his console with a look of disbelief. Holy mother of... What? Jake yelled. It's closing. Way past engagement speed. One KPS at least. Jake, it's on us. It's gonna hit. Fire. I am. Kit squeezed the trigger, and red streaks shot out of the bow. Several hit the approaching bogey dead on, and Jake could see debris fly off the vessel. But it was not enough to stop it. He recognized the tactic. The Corsicans didn't often do suicide runs. At least not Corsicans from the actual world of Corsica. They were far too proud, too devious. But several of the client worlds in the Corsican Empire boasted cultures that favored the tactic. New Kyoto, especially. That world was one of the first to join the Empire, sitting just a few light-years from Corsica herself. Its original settlers had shunned violence and devoted itself to bringing an enlightened agrarian world. But a string of devastating pirate raids over the centuries had convinced them of the need for a more aggressive defense. And when the Corsicans came along with the idea of the Pax Humana, the new Kyotans were the first to climb on board. Carrier 4, evasive maneuvers, suicide runner coming in evasive— Jake shouted into the comm, and Kit pelted the ship with everything their fighter had. But in the three seconds it took him to bark his instructions, he knew it was too late. A smoking craft burst into a fireball, and the expanding debris field just missed their port wing, but it smashed right into the bow of the troop carrier. Damn it! Jake could see the damage from the impact. Twisted metal and glass and bodies flew from the impact zone, which spewed wicked-looking flames, fanned by what he could only guess were ruptured oxygen tanks and fuel lines. Status of the carrier, he barked to Kit. Life support holding... Emergency bulkheads moving into place. A uh, ship is intact, but casualties unknown. A deeper voice than before crackled over the comm. Viper squad, this is Corporal Daniels. Lieutenant Gomez is dead. One or two. Our approach vector got thrown off. Our nav system is down. Please advise, over. Kit swore and keyed open the comm. Daniels, uh, adjust your approach. Five degrees to port. Be ready to decelerate in ten seconds and revert to maneuvering thrusters only. Copy. Copy. An explosion sounded over the comm, followed by yells and garbled voices. Daniels, you still with us? Jake shouted into the microphone. 
Only a cacophony of yells, klaxons, and screeching metal answered him. He glanced over at Kit, who shook his head. The nearest construction ring of the shipyard loomed ahead of them, holding the floating skeleton of a half-completed capital ship in the center. Eleven other construction rings held other ships, just like it in various stages of completion. Roger, still here, Viper 6. Deceleration in three, two, one. Jake smiled as he saw the carrier halt, as if it had suddenly gotten caught in thick molasses, and began turning to starboard using its maneuvering thrusters. Good work, Daniels. Now bring your belly right up against the central shaft of that ring and have at her. He surveyed the construction ring, a massive arc of metal surrounding the newly built capital ship. Hundreds of viewports dotted the surface of the ring, each a home to some workman or mechanic that made his or her living in space, building the future of Earth's contribution to the Corsican Imperial fleet. Most of them were probably looking out those windows and cheering them on, he surmised. Welders, electricians, technicians... Most blue-collar workers tended to be pro-resistance. Vapor 6, you've got a problem, Daniels' voice said over the comm. Cutting crew says our hull penetration system is out, completely destroyed from that impact. We're stuck in here, sir. No auxiliary units? Who's in command there, anyway? Garbled crackling answered him, followed by Daniels finishing his sentence. Destroyed in the blast. I'm afraid I'm it, sir. Command staff is all dead or severely wounded. Roger, uh, stand by. Jake glanced over at Kit. What do you think? Head back to the Fury. We're useless out here now. Give up? What else can we do? There's ten other carriers. They'll have to do without this one. Jake shook his head. No, we, we can't just give up. We have no idea how many carriers are making it through. Damn it, Kit, this is the big op. This is it. If we lose this one, we lose the war. Daniels's voice crackled over the comm. So, if you've got any ideas, I'm what ears. I've got a special mission to complete over here, on Admiral Pritchard's orders himself. Jake's eyebrows raised a hair. Admiral Pritchard gave a lowly corporal a special mission? Hold on, I'll ask Mission Command back on the Fury, said Kit. Jake stared at the bulkhead of the central shaft of the construction ring, barely listening to Kit talk to the ops team back on the Fury. He thought of the last few weeks. The uprising had gone well. Extremely well, in fact. They had encountered significant resistance, but all of their targets had fallen in quick succession. Intel reports said that the main bulk of the Corsican fleet was still occupied putting down the November clan rebellion in the Titanus sector, and a myriad of other worlds were in other stages of unrest requiring critical military resources and drawing the Empire's attention away from potential hotspots. Hotspots like Earth. Not to mention the ongoing conquests of the Corsicans. By last count, they had recently conquered their 612th planet out of the thousand or so settled worlds. And over sixty years ago, Earth was the 500th, almost like an anniversary prize for the Corsican Emperor on his Golden Jubilee. Jake clenched his fist. No, giving up was the last resort. Offs says two more carriers are lost, Kit said grimly. But they say to guard this carrier until the repair crew on board can fix the hull penetration unit. And if they can't? Sounds like they're not doing too hot over there. Repair crew could be dead. Kit shook his head. They didn't say. Still eyeing the construction ring's bulkhead, a thought struck Jake. Rooster... Fire a quick burst at that bay door over there. Kit snapped his head over to the pilot. You're kidding, right? Orders are to take the shipyards undamaged. Mostly undamaged, Rooster, mostly undamaged. Come on, just a quick burst. I'll get on the horn to Daniels. He thumbed on the comm. Daniels, Viper 6, you fellows ready for boarding? Daniels' deep voice sounded over the speakers. Yes, sir. About two hundred grunts locked and loaded, but, sir... Two hundred? Out of four hundred? Jake shook his head in quiet disbelief. Just get your helmets on, soldier. Prepare for vacuum. Kit's voice interrupted. Contact. Two o'clock and down. Crash. You got him? Jake said. On it, shotgun. Said the voice over the comm, and Jake saw the other fighter sweep past to meet the intruder. Kit turned to Jake. 
Okay, so what the hell do you think you're going to do? We're going to blast a hole in that bay door, and the Marines will disembark and vacuum and secure the entryways into that bay. No, we're not. That bay isn't even half as big as the carrier. She'll never fit in there. Jacob waved a hand. The tail will fit in, at least. That's all they need. And then what if it doesn't work, Jake? That's two hundred soldiers out there. If it doesn't work, the Empire wins. Damn it, Kit. They know what they signed up for, and so do you. This is their best chance to get on that ring. The sooner this thing is secure, the sooner we can move on to Tranquility Base, and then out to the Jupiter and Saturn bases. That's going to take weeks. And by then, the Empire will have put down the November Rebellion and will turn to focus on us. We're not a prize the Emperor will let slip out of his hands lightly. Kit threw up his hands. It's crazy, Jake. God, let's think this through. I have. Now fire. That's an order. Kit glared at him. His friend resented any mention of their disparate ranks. After all, they had joined the Resistance fleet at the same time. Yes, sir. His lips curled. Red streaks shot out from the fighter and punctured the bay door, and they watched as the interior atmosphere steamed out through the gaping hole left behind. Again, take out the whole door. Jake, these guns aren't meant for cutting. I'll have to unload our whole battery at that thing just to get it off. He was right. Jake supposed his gunner felt a little smug for revealing to him the obvious, but his mind was already moving. Flipping the ship around 180, he brought the tail up right next to the door, five meters off. Locking onto the orbital vector of the shipyards and engaging the gravitic brake, which would ensure no drift in the ship's position relative to the construction ring, he punched the conventional thrusters to full power, past full power. Ten shafts of white-hot exhaust blazed from the rear. Within moments, they'd had their effect, and a huge section of the door crumpled inward. Cutting the thruster power, he thumbed open the comm. Daniels, you're clear to go. Navigate the carrier so your ass sticks out into that bay and then engage a gravitic break. Gravitics are out, sir. Thrusters only. Damn. Told you we should have thought it through, said Kit. Jake ignored him. Daniels, maneuver in any way and wedge the ship against what's left of that bay door, then fire full reverse thrusters for a quarter of a second. That'll get you stuck in there nice and good. Rooster and I will back up against you and hold you in for a minute until you guys can all disembark. You all suited up? Affirmative, sir. Just give the word. Jake smiled. <laughs> Go. Happy hunting. Aye, sir. Kit eyed the sensor screen for contacts and, assured they were clear, looked out at the raging space battle all around them. Better hope this works. It will, Kit. Jake eyed the concern on Kit's face. And if it doesn't, it's all my responsibility. You're clear of this. He wondered what would happen to him if it didn't work. If somehow the Marines got stuck outside the carrier, but couldn't get inside the hallways beyond the landing bay. Demoted, most likely. Sent to prison for a few months or years. Resistance had no problem recruiting these days, and he was certainly replaceable. They watched as the carrier slowly rotated into position, its rear flank pointing toward the gaping hole in the bay door. Thin white jets streamed out of the front thrusters, less than one percent power, Jacob judged, and the craft gradually drifted backward into the hole, until he could almost swear he heard the creaking and squealing of the protesting metal. In fact, they did hear it coming over the open comm. Jake nodded. That's right, Daniels, nice and easy. When you stop, punch it for a quarter second. I so. The carrier inched backwards until finally the remains of the metal door had given all they could yield and the advance stopped. The thrusters roared to life for a fraction of a second, and the carrier jolted backward momentarily, wedging itself firmly into place. Jake maneuvered the front of the fighter up to the ruined remains of the carrier until the nose of his craft nestled firmly in the wreckage. Jake smiled, like they're kissing. Groaning metal reverberated through the cabin as Jake applied nominal power to the aft thrusters. All right, that's it, Daniels. We're nudged up against you good and tight. It's all up to you now. Good luck, soldier. Thank you, Vapa Six. Give us two minutes to get out. We'll leave a medic behind to tend the wounded, so don't go nowhere. Daniels out. Just as the Marine signed off, Kit swore. Ugh, multiple contacts. Six o'clock, three, no, four. And that's not all, Jake. He looked up to the pilot. They're coming from a new capital ship. 
It shifted into orbit just ten clicks away. Corsican, from Bismarck by the looks of it. So, a Bismarckian capital ship. Jake gritted his teeth. Bismarck was the other world, along with New Kyoto and Corsica, that formed the first triumvirate of worlds in the early Corsican Empire, and had the reputation of being the most ruthless of the three. He peered out the viewport. Sure enough, there it was, just barely visible, barreling toward Liberty Station. Packed with over fifty rail guns and a host of laser turrets and ion beam cannons, the massive Bismarckian capital cruiser had built up a reputation for itself over the years, one of heavy-handed repression and destruction. I assume Command has seen it. Ask for more cover, said Jake. He heard Kit talk with Central Command as he thumbed his comms open. Crash, you see that? Yeah, I see it. We're about to have one hell of a ride. Kit turned to look at him. Command says the Fury is still occupied with the other two Corsican capital ships. They can spare two squads of fighters and three frigates to help, but that's it. He glanced out the side viewport at the rapidly approaching vessel. Oh, they're nearly here. A slow whistle over the calm burst the momentary silence. Well, doesn't that just suck Rooster's giant ca crash? Cover us until the last of the Marines get off that carrier, then we're heading out there with you, Jake said, interrupting the men before Kit blew a gasket. What about the medics and wounded still on board? Well, we can defend them better if we're directly engaging the enemy, rather than sitting here with our ass exposed. Or at least, that's what Jake hoped. Corporal Daniels sprang out onto the wide ramp of the carrier with four other marines and dashed to the entrance door of the landing bay, the boots of their armored ASA suits pounding against the debris-littered deck. There was no echo to hear since the bay was at vacuum, but their all-situation armor had about an hour's supply of oxygen, so he was not particularly worried about air at the moment. What worried him was that the door from the bay into the rest of the central shaft was closed, and probably locked. A stocky marine bent down to test the handle, and sure enough it didn't budge. Stand aside, said the marine next to him, a wiry young woman shouldering a plasma RPG launcher. Take cover, she yelled, but didn't even wait for anyone to move or crouch down. Their ASA suits would more than protect them, and besides, they were in a hurry, damn it. A bright ball of intense, blinding energy shot across the bay, slamming into the door. Extreme-induced temperature gradients within the door vaporized pockets of metal, sending twisted fragments blasting out in all directions, peppering the surrounding marines who at least shielded their faces. And when the smoke cleared, smoke looks so odd in a vacuum, Daniels thought. The battalion began the advance through the door and into the hallway beyond. Fox team, secure barracks and armory. Delta and Echo teams, secure command hub. Omega team, on me, move! Daniels still couldn't believe he was barking out orders to a squad of Marines. He'd only enlisted in the Resistance Defense Service a year ago, but with all his commanders dead, what was a grunt to do? If he hadn't been secretly recruited by the Intelligence Service just three months ago, he might not even have been here in space, but back on the ground, fighting the Corsicans on their military bases scattered across the world. Assault rifle at the ready, he crept out into the hallway, following another group of soldiers. Good, no resistance so far. Well, good or bad, depending on how one looks at it. Daniels glanced down at his oxygen level indicator and saw he had well over ninety percent left. Private, what's the status of that door? Can it sustain atmospheric pressure? He looked at one of the young men he knew had tech experience and motioned toward the door at the end of the hallway. The short marine ran forward and examined the door controls. Looks like it. We just need to get to the other side somehow without losing all the air behind it. His voice suggested to Daniels that the kid was from the North American Deep South. Alabama, probably, or maybe Mississippi? Isn't there an emergency bulkhead we can activate somewhere along this hallway? I'm on it, replied the private, who ran back along the hallway past the entire battalion, stopping halfway to pull off a wall panel, revealing an access terminal. After some fiddling, he announced, pointing his armored finger back to Daniels, Y'all might want to stand over there by the corporal. Once this thing comes down, it ain't going back up. 
After the battalion repositioned itself, the private keyed the terminal, and the emergency bulkhead began a rapid descent, bisecting the hallway and effectively cutting them off from their casket of a troop carrier and the deadly vacuum of space. Now blast the door, and hold on to something, people. The other side is pressurized. The same marine with the plasma RPG took aim at the door at the end of the hall and fired once everyone had braced themselves. With a massive rush, the air on the other side filled their hallway, and after the air, gunfire. Suppressing fire! Forward teams, advance to cover! Go! And so the real battle began. Daniels rushed forward into the maelstrom of bullets, most of which glanced off of his armor, but occasionally, out of the corner of his eye, he saw a comrade fall, the projectile having found one of the few weak spots in their ASA suits. He kicked in a door halfway down the hall and raised his assault rifle. A group of terrified mechanics huddled in a corner with their hands raised. Daniels pointed them out to the Marine, following him. Watch them. We can't leave our back exposed. He pointed to the squad of Marines that had followed him through the door for cover. Omega Squad, let's get this over with. Advance down to the next room and we'll cover, he said, wrapping another Marine on the helmet. We'll hopscotch down the hall. The entrance to the construction ring is halfway down. Form up there. The men and women snapped into action. Most had been soldiers in the United Earth Defense Force for years, but only recently had everyone present signed on to the resistance openly. There had been little time to get to know one another. Most were from disparate units, brought together only recently to liberate Earth from the Corsicans. Most of the other Earth Defense Force units had not dared to make their resistance leanings known, but he was sure that a vast majority of the soldiers in the militaries of the five nations of Earth wanted the Corsicans out. And it was only a few months ago that he had joined the intelligence services as a tactical field officer, reporting directly to Admiral Pritchard himself. He'd been so proud of that. He'd itched to tell his father, but the actual existence of the military's new intelligence service was classified top secret, compartmentalized. So secret that not even the Corsicans knew. Daniels wasn't even sure the President of North America knew, but Pritchard had assured them all it was necessary, and that they'd see the fruits of their labors very soon. he damn well better be right. A minute later, the medic on a carrier signaled that the marine deployment was complete, and Jake eased the fighter away from the wreckage of the ship wedged into the massive bay door. "'Contact on us in ten seconds,' said Kit. "'The Bismarckian ship is advancing up one of our straggling troop carriers. Its escorts are engaging, but—' Kit broke off. Jake looked out his side viewport. The giant capital ship loomed ever closer— and two tiny explosions next to it indicated the fighter escort's demise, followed by the more sizable blast of the troop carrier catching a full barrage of railgun fire from the newly arrived Imperial ship. The calm crackled on. This is Admiral Deltatus of the Corsican Empire ship NPQR Behemoth, broadcasting to all rebel vessels. I bring a message from the Emperor and President of the Corsican Senate. A message of amnesty and goodwill. Cease fire immediately, and you, each of you, will be granted a full pardon. If you do not comply, you will be destroyed to maintain the Pax Humana. The voice had a thick German accent, indicative of its Bismarckian heritage, but the name was definitely Corsican. All Corsicans of any status, regardless of their origin, adopted Roman names when they attained any rank or power within the Empire, admirals and captains included. Silence. The fighters that had been closing on their position now maintained their distance. Kit glanced over at Jake. You believe him? Jake shook his head and rolled his eyes. Not on your life. The calm crackled to life again, this time with a distinguished English accent. This is Admiral Pritchard of the USS Fury, speaking for all United Earth ships. Admiral Dotatus, good day to you, sir. The Admiral's voice sang out of the speakers, as if the British gentleman were simply inviting a dear friend over for tea. I've been in contact with Earth Fleet Command in Dallas, and I do believe I have an answer for your Emperor. I may not have my terminology quite right, sir. My North American counterparts employ an odd vocabulary at times, but my superiors have directed me to answer you to uh, suck our hairy balls. 
I believe they mean bollocks, sir. Also, to get the hell off of our comm channel. It's what we're using to communicate with each other to blow you out of the sky, after all. Do be a gentleman about it. Kit and Jake, in spite of themselves and their grim situation, snorted with laughter. The British Admiral, in the short time Jake had served under him, had won over the undying loyalty of every space jock in the fleet with his deadpan wit, and more importantly his brilliantly wicked second sense of strategy and tactics. Admiral Deodotus's voice boomed over the speakers in response. Richard, come now. We went to the academy together. You were just a few years ahead of me, but I saw you there. I respected you. Everyone respected you. You were brilliant, after all. No finer tactician in the fleet. Now look what you've become. You've spilled the innocent blood of thousands, or in the name of an unjust war for an unjust cause. The Pax Humana has ensured peace and prosperity for a thousand years against the pirates and scums that would rob us of our freedom and our lives. Is that what you want? To return to those dark days? Admiral Pritchard answered immediately. From the frying pan into the fire, I say. At least with pirates we didn't have to request in triplicate if we could blow our noses, old boy. No, I believe our answer is what it's always been. Get the hell off our world, and then we will talk. Good day, sir. All hands, continue the battle plan. Pritchard out. Pritchard, I— Admiral Deotitus began in protest, but the calm cut out, jamming, no doubt, from the USS Fury. Within moments, a barrage of railgun fire erupted from the behemoth, pelting the approaching frigates with a withering assault of explosive projectiles. The two promised squadrons of fighters descended on the massive capital ship and began blasting away at the railgun turrets and ion beam cannons, dodging the fire of both the behemoth and the swarm of enemy fighters that spilled from its bays. Kit, let's get over there. What happened to those contacts? They changed course to intercept the frigates engaging the behemoth. Jake pushed the controls forward and the fighter leaped out to join the fray. He had never flown in such chaos. Railgun fire sailed past in a blur. A torrent of ion fire and conventional fighter gunfire raked across his field of view as he leaped and dodged and looped his way through the raging battle. Crash! Cover us while we take out that tower! He yelled into the comm as he sped toward an ion beam cannon installation on the huge, M-shaped cruiser. They're locking onto a shotgun, Kit said. Got it. Jake rolled the fighter and swerved just as the crackling blue beam leapt out of the cannon, missing them by a meter. Sparks flew out of a panel between them as the induction from the passing beam wreaked havoc on the electrical system. We good, Kit? Long-range sensors are out, but we're fine. Good, take it out. Torpedo's locked, and... Away! Kit held his breath as he squeezed the torpedo trigger, and two half-meter-long rockets shot out of the bow. Jake grinned. Sporting a mere half of a microgram of antimatter each, the torpedoes would sure catch the Imperial's attention. Countermeasure fire burst out of the cannon toward the torpedoes, catching one which detonated in a tremendous explosion but the other found its mark. Jake pulled the fighter up as the tower erupted in a fireball, quickly extinguished by space. Yee-ha! Nice shooting, rooster! Crash called over the comm. Look out, Crash, two on your tail, said Kit. Jake swooped the fighter around to trail the two bogies, and with flawless precision, Kit took them out with a single burst each. Jake let loose with a whoop and aimed the bow at the next unlucky Corsican fighter. He peered out his window at the frigates pounding away at the behemoth, but it was clear the two smaller vessels were sustaining massive damage themselves from the constant barrage of railgun and ion beam cannon fire. How much longer do you think the frigates have? Jake asked. He tried not to sound glum, but it was difficult. Minutes, said Kit. I'm not sure what Pritchard's got up his sleeve, but now is the time. Jake nodded watching as explosion after explosion rocked the two smaller frigates hovering near the massive behemoth. Agreed. The advance down the central hallway of the hub of the construction ring was grueling, to say the least, and Daniels estimated they'd lost up to a quarter of their soldiers. But at last they reached the center of the hub, and he led Omega Team down the hallway that would grant them access to the construction ring, and from there the real target the whole reason for the operation that day. He watched as the other teams proceeded to their destinations, then turned to run with his squad down the hallway, 
this one far narrower than the central hubs. Relaxing a little, he let his rifle down slightly as he knew there would be very few enemy marines in this direction, away from the command hub. The enemy would expect all of them to converge on that central location, which made sense since all shipyard functions could be controlled from there. The Imperials would not be expecting the boarding parties to have any interest in a skeleton. He peered out a window as they passed it, and surveyed the massive hulk of a ship that was still in the early stage of construction. Girders and ribbing spanned its length and breadth, indicating an elegant sweep of arms designed to hold fighter bays and gravitic drives. But it was only a skeleton. A skeleton with a beating heart, as the head of military intelligence and Admiral Pritchard himself had assured him. Pritchard had ensured that the construction of the next-generation battleships in the shipyard were far enough along that at least some of the ships had rudimentary thrusters and at least one gravitic drive installed along with its antimatter engine. And this one had all three gravitic drives by the look of it. He touched the name etched onto the entrance to the tube that spanned the distance from the construction ring to the ship itself. The NPQR Peregrine. Daniels shook his head. Navis Populus Romanis. Literally, the ship and the Roman people. Such a shame they wouldn't have time to scrub the designation off and replace it with something more fitting. USS Peregrine sounded far more worthy. They made their way to the bridge through the deserted, sterile hallways. As far as he could tell, there was really only one route there, since all the other routes hadn't even been constructed yet. The bridge door opened at his approach, and he was met by a cacophony of loose wire half-installed computer and view-screen panels, and only one portable chair. He took off his helmet, and the rest of Omega team followed his lead. He looked into their eyes. He hardly knew them, but they had his respect. One of the women, a stout, brawny, black-haired girl of no more than twenty, lifted a hand to her forehead in a slow, solemn salute. He stood at attention and saluted back, trying to keep his face stoic. Let's get to work. Shotgun, the Fury is signaling to fall back. Everyone's to fall back to the Fury, said Kit. Jake glanced out the window. Just in time, he thought. The frigates looked like they were on their last leg. Slowly they began drifting away from the behemoth, and the remains of the two fighter squadrons covered their retreat. So it's over? What the hell? Crash's voice blared over the calm. Jake could hardly believe it either. After all their advances the past week, they were retreating? Well, oh, Pritchard must be planning something. This was too pedestrian, too sloppy of a move for it to be an effective strategy. What good were the shipyards if they still had an enemy fleet out there that could take it back tomorrow? Frigates are clear of the behemoth. Let's get out of here, Jake. He gripped the controls until his knuckles turned white. Roger. Returning to the Fury. He pointed the bow toward their own capital ship, larger and deadlier than the behemoth, but even it looked on its last leg. Two other Corsican capital ships had been pounding away at it the whole time, and now it began moving away from the shipyards at a crawl. Out of the corner of his eye, movement. Something was moving in the shipyards. He looked at one of the twelve construction rings, looked at the skeleton of a ship held in its center, and reassured himself that... He'd only seen a stray fighter flit in between it and the ring. He glanced to one of the other rings, and his jaw dropped. Holy hell! You see that, rooster? He pointed at the skeleton of a ship that now slowly moved away from its ring, connection tubes snapping into clouds of debris as it pulled away. With his eyes darting about the shipyard, he saw two more begin to move as well. Three of the twelve half-built battleships now accelerated, slowly, almost imperceptibly away from their moorings. I see it, but I don't believe it. Do those things even have power? They must. They probably— Kit interrupted. Holy shit, did you see that? He had, and he couldn't believe his eyes. One of the ships disappeared. He snapped his head around, searching for it, and he saw it barreling straight for the behemoth with only hundreds of meters now separating them. Jake swore under his breath. Pritchard, you beautiful, beautiful man. The skeleton, nearly the same size as the behemoth, 
impacted, impaling the other ship on its array of half-finished girders. When the core of the ship connected with the unlucky target, a flash filled their view screens. There goes the antimatter engine, said Kit. When the glare faded, all that remained in view was the behemoth, heavily damaged, spewing flame from countless gaping holes in its hull. There go the other two, said Jake, pointing back to the shipyards. In the blink of an eye, both of the other two half-completed ships disappeared, and they craned their heads back to the Fury, which by now had put some distance between it and the pursuing Corsican ships. The skeletons snapped into existence right in their path, and they collided with even more force than the first had with the behemoth. Pritchard's voice sounded triumphantly over the calm. All squads, do be so kind as to go and clean up my mess. Viper and Hornet squads, behemoth, jackal and wolf squads take the Maximus, Dryad and Red squads, please dispose of the Parthenon. Little bugger, it took out my gravitic drive. Now remember what we all learned in Boy Scouts, my friends, leave no trace. Now get to work and happy hunting. Pritchard out. Grinning, Jake pulled up hard on the controls, and the fighter wheeled around in a sharp turn, pointing the bow back toward the wreck of the behemoth. Streams of air and debris and bodies still shot out of the ragged scars left by the crashed shell of a ship, but several of its gun batteries still blazed away. Easy there, shotgun, she's still dangerous, said Kit, thumbing the triggers every now and then when a Corsican fighter would come under his sights. I see it. Crash, are you still with us? The calm crackled. Still here, shotgun. Let's take care of those other ion cannon towers, and then we'll have free reign over the bastard. And what about the fighters? Cover us, we'll take care of the cannons. He pushed the controls forward, and they shot toward one of the remaining active towers. A pair of enemy fighters swooped down to meet them, eliciting a curse from Kit. Go, oh, shotgun, watch out! No worries, rooster. He looped the fighter up and around, giving Crash a clear shot at them, and came in again for another try. There, rooster, have at it! Locked on, torpedoes away! As they shielded their eyes, a rocking explosion followed, which they felt from the impact of a shower of debris from the cannon. Streams of hot smoke shot away from the behemoth, which Jake recognized as missile fire. Nuclear signal! She's firing her nukes! I'm counting! He looked up. All of them. I've got fifty-two contacts all headed toward the Fury. Intercepting fire from the Fury? Affirmative. They looked out the viewport toward their flagship watching as dozens of streaks of light bolted toward the fury, which erupted with a dazzling fury of interceptor shells. As a shell slammed into a warhead, the missile would explode harmlessly, its nuclear capabilities rendered inert. But several continued on toward their target, zigzagging to avoid the outgoing shells from the fury. Three left. No, two, Kit said, reading his sensor display. Ha! One more down. Last one to go. Last one. Last one. His brow furrowed. They both looked back out the viewport. Cover your eyes, Kit! Jake yelled, punching the autopilot button just in time. Even with both hands clamped down firmly over their eyes, they could still see the blinding flash, the light glowing red as it trickled through hands and eyelids. Jake opened his eyes and blinked several times. Shit! What was our dose at this distance? Kit glanced at the readout and pressed a few buttons. Two hundred milliseverts. Taking our shielding into account, we'll be fine. A fury sustained a direct hit. Jake peered out the viewport, studying the hull of the fury. The port side of the ship looked bad. Dozens of viewports streamed precious air into space, and a gaping hole the size of a football field grinned out at them, revealing girders, trusses, supply lines, and deck plates. The comm blared with the voice of the communications officer of the fury. All hands, continue battle plan. Fury is fine. Repeat, Fury is fine. Fury out. They both blew out a sigh of relief. Well, she doesn't look fine, but I guess we take her word for it, said Jake. That's odd, said Kit. What is it? Jake looked over at Kit's readout. Behemoth is changing course toward the Fury. She's accelerating, but scanners show that her antimatter is out. Her warheads are expended. Gravitics are out. Permanently, it seems. She's got nothing left, Jake. He looked up. They're picking up speed, and that warhead took out the Fury's maneuvering gravitics, too. Oh, she's got her thrusters. He thumbed off the autopilot and kept pace with the behemoth. The calm blared to life. 
an eye for an eye, Admiral. You reap what you sow. Theodotus's voice sounded raw as if he'd recently been coughing. Fury status, said Jake. Kit's fingers raced across the readout. Uh, she's pulling away, but not fast enough. Speed of the behemoth relative to the fury is 1.2 kps in rising. Ah, it's going to be one hell of an impact. 1.2 kps. Glanced out the viewport toward the crippled fury. It grew steadily larger. Estimating the impact to occur in just seconds, he sprung into action. Flipping the ship around so the stars outside passed as a blur, he darted the fighter toward the stern of the behemoth. Kit, get a lock on all aft starboard thrusters now. On it, locking. Torpedoes away. A knot in Jake's stomach tightened as he counted each blast. One, two, three. There's still one thruster active, targeting guns. The guns pelted the last starboard thruster with a shower of high-caliber bullets, but it remained active. Jake swore. Realizing there was nothing left to do, he gunned the engine, aiming straight toward the thrusters. Kit gritted his teeth, apparently understanding Jake's intent. The impact jolted both of them hard against their restraint, and the fighter ricocheted off the massive thruster toward starboard. Stars wheeled past the viewport in a blur. Though they were alive. Oh, we did it, Jake! Thrusters offline! Behemoth is accelerating! Off course towards— He glanced up at Jake with a grin. Towards the atmosphere! They can't escape gravity at that speed! Thumbing the autopilot on to right the ship's orientation— he watched as the behemoth's underside started glowing. Debris from the wreckage of the skeleton ship burst into white-hot embers and flared off the hull in streaks, which started to glow an even brighter red. Jake gave a whoop when the massive ship split right down the middle. Pritchard's voice boomed over the calm. Viper Six, you bloody bastards, you poached my kill! He erupted in laughter. Thank you, mates, I'm sure there's a medal or some crumpets you fellows are in for or something. Pritchard out. Jake glanced over at Kit. How are we holding up? Ah, uh, we've got no life support, no gravitics, no weapons, and from what it looks like several bad leaks. But the remaining thrusters can get us back to the docking bay of the Fury. You know, shotgun, he continued, not even looking up. That was incredibly stupid. It could have got us both killed. He nodded. Yeah... Switching the propulsion over to thrusters from Gravidix, he pushed forward on the controls, bringing the bow to line up with the Fury, which now appeared to be mopping up the remaining two Corsican capital ships. With the flick of a finger, he set a course for the main fighter bay. But I don't like to lose. 2. The talking heads on the news program were starting to annoy him, but Jacob Mercer still couldn't manage to wipe the grin off of his face. He motioned the bartender for a third round and pointed at the monitor, nudging the man next to him. I love it when they cut to Dallas. It's like the whole city just exploded with confetti. Crash nodded. The air conditioning was out in the tiny sports bar on Highway 98, Miracle Strip Parkway, the locals called it, so tiny beads of sweat glistened off the man's ebony forehead. Makes sense. Political headquarters of the resistance and all. I gazed up at the screen, watching as flurries of white bits of paper streamed out of the hundreds of skyscrapers, looming up like a forest of mile-high steel and glass, showering the millions of people massed in the streets below. New York City's party isn't even a tenth of this, he noted, thanking the bartender as he poured Jake another shot of whiskey. He glanced at his watch a vintage titanium timepiece from the 22nd century his father had given him for his birthday a few years ago. Possibly the only thing the man had ever given him, besides his name. It's 0800. We gotta be at HQ in two hours, so don't get too drunk, you bastard, he said, watching the monitor switch to footage from the previous evening. The NPQR behemoth, streaking down through the atmosphere like a giant asteroid, and the enormous impact deep in the southern Atlantic Ocean kept playing repeatedly throughout the broadcast. Tsunamis barreled ashore all along the eastern coast of South America and the western coast of Africa, but in spite of the minor destruction, the major cities around the world erupted in celebration. 
Live cameras displayed the rest of the battle as the USS Fury parked alongside the remaining two Corsican capital ships, the NPQR Maximus and Parthenon, and proceeded to blast the two into oblivion with its surviving railguns and torpedoes. The two Corsican ships put up a valiant effort, considering what they had just been through, but in the end the satellite cameras zoomed in on the Maximus blazing through the upper atmosphere like the behemoth before it, exploding as its antimatter engine went critical. The Parthenon offered its surrender, which Pritchard accepted grudgingly, and after it was clear the battle was turning into more of a mop-up operation, the governments of the world publicly announced an official switch of allegiances to the resistance movement, beginning with the North and South American governments, and followed swiftly by Europe and the rest. The only holdout was Asia, who insisted on a peace treaty before any commitments were made. Drunk, says the man on his third whiskey. Coolish shotgunner, you won't be able to fly. We still got missions after all, the war ain't over. Crash sipped his water, having finished his first and only beer nearly half an hour before. The creak of the old wooden door announced the arrival of a new patron. Jake glanced over his shoulder as a woman in half of a resistance uniform ambled through the doorway. Half, since the uniform shirt was tied around her waist by its sleeves, revealing a torso covered in only a khaki tank top. He tried not to gape at her flawless body as she approached the bar. Curves in all the right places. She took a stool at the end of the bar, swinging her leg up and over it, and motioned for a beer. Swirling tattoos covered her shoulders in various designs, and her close-cropped blonde hair swept over her forehead, nearly covering her eyes. She blew it aside with pursed lips and swigged the beer offered to her by the bartender. Stop staring, shotgun, Crash whispered. Why? asked Jake as he forced his eyes to drift past the girl toward the monitor hanging on the wall. With his peripheral vision, he saw her glance at him and smile before returning to her beer and looking up at the other monitor behind the bartender. Because you don't want to repeat the experience of earning your call sign, Crash quipped reminding him of the unfortunate event in which he'd been dubbed Shotgun. Ignoring his buddy's advice, he grabbed his drink and ambled over to the woman. She didn't even look at him. Mind if I join you? She let out a mock sigh. I suppose. He smiled as he sat down. A flirt. He liked flirts. You come here often? I've never seen you here before. He couldn't take his eyes off of hers, not a hint of makeup, yet easily the most striking, intense eyes he'd ever seen. I only come here when I get through blasting Corsican bastards out of the sky. You? Oh, so you're a gunner? Well, which ship were you on? Jake leaned closer to her. A gunner? She laughed. A deep, throaty laugh. No. Pilot. Hornet squad. Lieutenant Anya Grace at your service. She set down her beer and offered her hand. Jacob Mercer, uh, also pilot Viper squad at your, um, service. He took her hand, silently willing his language processing skills to work as well as the lower half of his body. Hornet squad, huh? You guys did some nice flying out there last night. You're right, we did. She smiled and took another gulp of her beer. Nice. Beautiful, flirty, and confident. His favorite type. He grinned and let his eyes drop from her face. She set the glass down and wiped her mouth. Get a good look? He snapped his eyes back to hers. Sorry, hmm? She rolled her eyes, then stood up, facing him. Look, sweetie, I usually come here because I can find men who know what they got and can give it to me. She glanced around the half-empty bar waving her arm. Is that you, or should I go sit somewhere else? Uh, no, ma'am. I mean, yes, ma'am. His heart pounded. A successful mission, a saved battleship, a grateful admiral, and now this? Couldn't believe how this day was shaping up. Well, she said expectantly. He looked up and down her perfect body, feeling suddenly flustered. What, you mean now? Here? 
her brow furrowed with a look of concern. I can wait if you'd like to call your mom and ask her permission. Wow. He shook his head in disbelief, held up his hands. She grabbed one and led him to the women's restroom. Once there, she shut the door and locked it, turning to him to rip his shirt off. She pushed him back against the wall with her back to the mirrors, and he got to see her from behind as he pressed up against her front. More swirling tattoos grazed her back and shoulders, serpents and dragons, and almost out of place a small heart above her right buttock. And she was good, direct, forceful, and good. When he zipped up, she reached down to pick up his undershirt for him, holding it up to her nose and taking a deep breath before she handed it over. Thanks, champ. Thanks for helping a girl out. She flashed a wry smile at him and stroked his chest once before zipping up and reaching down to turn the sink water on. Her hands splashed water up into her face and she dried off with a towel before grabbing the door handle and leaving him to finish dressing alone. Well, that was awesome, he said to the empty bathroom. The automated taxi smelled like cigarettes and booze, and he swore the damn thing overcharged him. But nothing could pull his thoughts away from the memory of that mirror and that naked, perfect, tattooed backside. Hey, are you listening to me? I said HQ called us to return immediately. We don't have time to stop at the barracks. Crash studied his data pad, poking at a few buttons. Jake pulled himself away from the memory to focus momentarily. Uh, what? Why? We've still got two hours, right? Didn't say. They just said to drop what you're doing and go straight to the base. What you need at the barracks, anyway? Jake stared out the window, toward the sprawling Eglin Space Force base, trying to remember why. Oh, uh, yeah. Hey, hand me your pad for a second. Crash tossed it to him, and Jake thumbed a button near the top. Call Janet Mercer of Bainbridge Island. The pad spoke to him in an androgynous voice. I assume you meant Janet Mercer, mother of Lieutenant Jacob Mercer. Yes, he snapped back, adding under his breath. Do you think I meant you, toaster? Several moments later, his mother's face appeared on the screen. Happy birthday, Mom. Jacob! Thank you, thank you. I thought you'd be way too busy to call. Did you see the news? Have you been watching? Her warm face filled the screen, wrinkles and all. He chuckled. Yeah, Mom, I got uh, front row seating. Her eyes widened and a hand rose to her mouth. You don't mean... Oh, tell me you... Don't tell me you were up there. Uh, classified, Mom. I might have been up there, and I might have been down here watching on the big screen. He winked to her, a signal to indicate exactly where he had been earlier that same day. Oh, my goodness, I'm just glad you're okay. They say half our fighters didn't make it out of that fight. Half. Half, indeed. He tried not to think of their faces. Not yet, at least. There would be time for mourning in a few days when the next few battles were won and they had cemented their victory. For now, though, it was still time to fight. To celebrate and fight. Jacob, you okay? You probably lost some friends up there. His mother was reaching up to her camera as if to touch his face. Yeah, Mom, a lot of, a lot of good people died. But hey, we won, right? Uh, that's what matters. We're free again. No more empire. Not here, anyway. They won't think of coming back here for a long time. Well, I sure hope not, his mother said, nodding. In fact, just last week my general welfare application was denied by the government just because of a typo. A typo! Leave it to his mother to put everything in perspective. That's awful, mother. How did you cope? He said wryly. Oh, don't patronize me, Jacob. It was supposed to be my sole source of income for the next few years until my annuity matures. It's stuff like this that the emperor gets wrong. She seemed to notice his skeptical expression. I mean, sure, the disappearances and the repression and that god-awful religion they shoved down our throats for the past sixty years. Sure, but, but it's the day-to-day -day inanities that get to me. He nodded as if he completely agreed with her. Sure, Mom, sure, he added. So... Uh, 
You say it was a typo? What kind? An embarrassed look passed over her face, just for a moment, before she nodded vigorously and said, Okay, I may have transposed accidentally transposed my age. Transposed? You mean you said you were thirty-six? It was an accident, really, Jacob, she said. Well, you come by it honestly, at least, Mom, he said, noticing her humble look of, oh, you shouldn't have, before adding. I mean, it's what you've been telling everyone for years now, so it's no wonder it was the first thing you put down. She shot him a wrathful look, then resumed her smile. So, got me anything this year? Same thing you got me last year, Mom. What, a mother's undying love? Look, Jacob, you know I'm fixed income on... He held up his hands. I'm kidding, Mom, seriously. Of course I got you a present. Go check your mail. What? I mean, really, you got me something? Oh, you shouldn't have. Really, Jacob, you've got better things to focus on right now without having to worry about your old mother. I mean... She rambled on, but Jacob could see she was getting up to check her mail receptacle. Muting the receiver, he said, uh, a data pad. Book one economy flight to Bainbridge Island for me and say, uh, two, no, three. He glanced over at Crash. We get leave in two months, he said, without even looking up from a game he was playing on his femtopod. Two months from today, he finished. From which account, Lieutenant Mercer? The androgynous voice asked. Which account? What do you mean, which account? My account. Your account shows a balance of exactly fifteen cents, sir. The voice sounded almost smug. Jake wondered how that was possible. Fifteen cents? Now he was sure the auto taxi overcharged him. Just, just, I, I don't know. Apply for an advance against my next paycheck from the military and send a confirmation to my mom in a nice pretty envelope. Hurry. Processing. Loan applied for. Funds will be deducted from your next deposit. Booking flight now. His mother's face returned to the screen and he clicked the mute off. Nothing there. Jacob, are you sure you sent something? I'm sure, Mom. Go check again. I've got confirmation that it's there. Maybe you missed it under the junk mail. Well, okay. Be right back. He waited for her to reappear, and when she did, she grasped a shining silvery envelope, on which she could clearly see printed the words Happy Birthday. Man, that computer's getting really good. Jake, really, you're coming up here? Yeah, Mom, happy birthday. He glanced out the window and saw that the grav car was slowing down. Eglin Space Force Base loomed nearby. Hey, uh, look, Mom, I've got to go. I'm back on duty. All right, dear. Say hi to your father for me. She forced a smile. Jacob knew that in spite of the nasty divorce twenty years ago, she tried to keep things cordial for him and his sister. Dad? I haven't seen him in years. But, Jacob, he's right there in Destin. Really? Years? Yeah, Mom. Hey, gotta go. Good to see you. You look great, by the way. He swore he could see her blush. Bye, sweetie. Call soon. Her face disappeared, and he handed the pad back to Crash. Sweet lady, said Crash as he folded the pad and stuffed it in his pocket. The door opened for them automatically as the car landed just outside the command center at Eglin. Jake nodded. She's the best. The woman basically sacrificed her journalism career to raise him and his sister Claire all by herself. And yet still, after all this time, she was classy enough to send regards to her ex-husband. Maybe she was right. He decided the first thing he'd do when he got back from the next mission would be to look him up. Dustin was only ten miles away, after all. The main briefing room in Eglin's command complex was immense, with hundreds of seats arranged auditorium style and enormous curved view screens wrapping the walls. They settled in some seats next to a few other Viper squad members and conversed quietly. There was an odd mood to the air, not at all what one would expect the day after such a stunning victory. Several hundred officers jumped to their feet, and Jake, not seeing who had entered the room, rose with them, through the doors behind the podium, a tall, bald, elderly-looking officer made his way onto the central dais and approached the microphone. Greetings, said Admiral Pritchard. Please, sit. His voice was unusually subdued, and a knot began to form in Jake's stomach. Kit leaned over to him. 
It sounds bad, whatever it is. Jake nodded and focused on the wrinkled face of the Admiral. At 0700, our listening post in low orbit around Octurus picked up a gravitic signal. The signatures of the spectrum indicates an imperial presence, and after careful analysis we have determined that the mass displacement and the source of the signal was on the order of three to four billion metric tons. A gasp of disbelief rose from the assembled officer. Four billion tons? Jake tried to do the math in his head. For those counting, that translates to between fifteen and twenty centurion-class heavy cruisers. Our best guess is that the Empire has wrapped up operations stemming from the rebellion in the November sector far earlier than anticipated and is now headed here. As some of you know, for capital ships larger than ten million metric tons or so, the gravitic shift navigation route from Arcturus passes through the orbit of Vega, then directly to Sol. Our listening post shifted the datapod directly to Earth orbit, of course, due to its minuscule mass. The last part he said over the rising din of chatter among the increasingly nervous men and women. He paused, tapping the microphone with a finger. Ladies and gentlemen, please, hysteria will be of no service to us. We will press on and keep calm and do our duty. The fallen heroes last night demanded of us. He paused, letting the memory of their friends steal their resolve. He continued. We expect they will shift from Vega orbit within the hour, and when they enter Sol orbit, only minutes are required to charge the gravitic energy banks to make the shift to Earth orbit. We have, he took a deep breath, countermeasures planned. They will not save us without the skill, the concentration, the grit, and the resolve of each and every one of you, and those who serve under you. I am needed elsewhere, but Admiral Gutierrez will brief you on the battle plan. He stepped aside from the podium, his shoulders vaguely hunched. That man has seen more battle as a commander in the Imperial fleet than the rest of us combined, Jake thought, and slowly, straightening his curved back, raised an arm to his forehead in solemn salute. Every soldier in the assembly hall rose to their feet and returned the salute in a silence that seemed to Jake both heroic and ominous. Admiral Pritchard turned and left the auditorium, and Admiral Gutierrez approached the podium. The briefing went on for over twenty minutes, and Jake grew restless. As battle plans went, it was a simple one. Defend Earth. Go to any length possible. Now that the majority of Earth's governments had officially sided with the resistance, new resources lay open to them, including, happily, four capital ships that the North American and European Joint Space Fleet had been holding back a few dozen extra frigates and light cruisers and hundreds of extra fighter squadrons. So the odds were not hopelessly against them, but the chances that most of them would not live to see the next day were high, and they all knew it. Jake grit his teeth. Gutierrez continued his briefing. Second Division, fighter squads, you are assigned suborbital patrol and defense duty for the northern latitudes. Third Division squads have southern latitudes. Every other fighter division is in orbit. First and fourth you will escort the Fury, as usual, and fifth through eighth will escort the USS Odinero. All other divisions are on the frigate and light cruiser battle groups. Lower orbital teams. You are responsible for missiles that make it through the perimeter defenses. In support of the ground-based ion beam cannons and surface-to-air missile interceptors. Uh, upper orbital teams. The Admiral spoke quickly and efficiently, flipping through some maps and orbital charts on the view screens before pausing and glancing up at them all. I suppose I don't have to impress upon you all the importance of your performance today. He started slowly, in a more somber tone of voice. Earth's very freedom hangs in... An explosion rocked the building and the power momentarily went before auxiliary lights kicked in. Jake heard Crash swear. Another blast, this time a little farther away, but followed by a third that appeared to hit the auditorium building as large chunks of the ceiling caved in, crushing a half-dozen people in the center of the room. "'To your stations!' yelled Admiral Gutierrez as he ran from the podium with his security escort through the double doors behind the raised dais, narrowly dodging more falling debris. The room erupted into organized chaos, 
as nearly two hundred officers bolted for the double doors on either side of the room. Another blast rocked the building, and Jake wasn't sure if he was glad or not that he was in the command complex. On the one hand, it had reinforced blast-proof walls and ceilings, could survive a full-on nuclear or antimatter strike. On the other hand, it was a target, and whoever was bombing it right now was persistent. Who the hell is it? He yelled at Kit as they scrambled for the door. If they could only get to the fighter bay, they could have a chance against whatever threat lay above. Probably some Imperial sleeper says. Or now that I think about it, the Asian Republic. They never announced their support for the Resistance, and now that the Imperials are on their way back in force, oh, they're probably just trying to curry favor. Ahead of them, a man and woman stumbled to the ground. They both bent down to assist the fallen pair, who, by the blood streaming from their heads, seemed to have been struck by falling debris. The woman glanced at their flight uniforms and insignia. Thank you, boys, but don't worry about me. Get to your ships and blast those bastards out of the sky. Jake noticed her commander's bar in her uniform and shouted, Yes, sir. Once out of the auditorium, they sprinted down the hallway, aiming for the doors that would lead outside into the Viper hangar bay. Despite the bad news from the Arcturus listening post and the current bombardment, Jake felt alive. This was what he was built for. This was why he signed on to the space fleet. He thrived on adrenaline and he knew it. And he couldn't help but grinning inside as he ran. And the odds were against them. Even better. Once outside, they bolted across the courtyard and tried not to look at the scattered, charred bodies sprawled on the ground. Unlucky souls who hadn't had time to take cover when the first missile struck. Kit stopped at one of them. Kit, no time, he's a goner, Jake said. I know, I'm just taking his assault rifle. Kit pulled the gun away from the blackened arms, and Jake had to grit his teeth to avoid becoming sick. As a fighter pilot, he was mostly removed from the gore. He had the privilege of dealing death to his foes from afar, and rarely saw the results of his gunner's trigger finger. They continued running, and Jake saw that Crash had caught up to them. He pointed up ahead. Look, troop transports are landing. We're being invaded, said Crash, panting as he fell into step with them. He was right. They watched as several oblong transport ships descended, one landing just behind the Viper hangar they were aiming for. In spite of the high probability they would encounter a firefight before they could get to their fighters, they quickened the pace, sprinting as fast as they could for the hangar bay. Bursting through the side door of the building, their eyes were met by chaos. At the rear door, a few marines held up the advance of the encroaching invaders, but they looked far outnumbered based on the fire they were taking. One of the three fell, shot through the neck, one of the few places the ASA armor was vulnerable. Crash bolted toward his fighter. His gunner was already making a dash for it as well. Jake and Kit ran toward their ship, flinching every time a stray bullet glanced off of whatever fighter they were running past. They nearly stumbled over an Asian-looking woman, kneeling on the ground next to a bloody figure. Jake noticed her lieutenant's insignia. Lieutenant, he's a goner. On your feet. Move! He could barely hear her over the din around them. He's my pilot. She touched his bloody face. He's my pilot, she repeated. And I'm his gunner. What do I do? Her voice sounded faint and weak, as if she was in a daze. A barrage of bullets strafed the fighter hulking over them, and they all ducked, including the woman. Kit yelled, They're breaking through the door! We took out the guard! He took aim at the soldiers, spilling through the door, and began firing, dropping two of them with clean shots through the neck. Get to the fighter, I'll hold them off! Without waiting for an answer, the short, balding gunner ran toward the rear door of the hangar bay, assault rifle blazing. Kit! No! Damn it! Jake muttered as he watched his friend take up a position near the door. Regarding the lieutenant, still crouching next to her dead pilot, he guessed she was in a state of shock and felt sorry for her. But he also knew there was no time to feel sorry. He reached down and grabbed her wrist. Let's go, lieutenant, you're with me. She allowed herself to be led to the cover of the fighter. Another flight deck technician collapsed to the floor several meters away. The back of his head had been blown off. What's your name, Lieutenant? Poe, she murmured. Megan Poe. 
We're going to get out of here, Poe. We just got to get over to my bird. She's the one right over there. He eyed the back door to the hangar where Kit and a handful of flight deck technicians were holding back the onslaught. Is he dead? She didn't take her eyes off of the dead pilot splayed out on the floor a few feet away. Yes. Look, we need to get moving. Once we're up there, we'll be more help than as sitting ducks out here. Ready? Her brow wrinkled and she seemed to steel herself. Nodding slowly, she said, Yeah, I'm ready. Run. He jumped up and, still holding her hand, made an all-out dash to his fighter. Once he was up inside, he could blast the rear doorway with suppressing fire and Kit could join them in the cockpit. One of the technicians by the door fell, clutching his bloody stomach just as Jake wrenched open the door to the fighter. You good to shoot? He yelled, jumping into his pilot's seat. Her only answer was to sit in the gunner's chair and switch on the console, wrapping the comm set and targeting viewfinder over her head. Good, at least she seemed to be coming out of it. In spite of the continuing rat-a-tat of gunfire bursts and seemingly constant shouts and screaming, his hands flew over the control board, initiating the gravitic drive and thrusters. You've got power. Fire when you got a good clear shot. We're clear now, she said, staring out the front viewport. Glancing up to see what she meant, his heart nearly stopped. Kit lay propped up against the blood-smeared wall by the door, and it was clear by the gaping hole in his head that he was dead. No. Shoot the bastards, he muttered. Poe thumbed the trigger, and red streaking gunfire erupted from the fighter's quad guns, raking over the rear door even as a squad of enemy soldiers was running through it, blasting apart their bodies and spraying the walls with yet more blood and entrails. Keep firing. We've got to give everybody time to get to their birds. Jake could feel the wrath grow inside of him, and it was everything he could do to refrain from pounding the console with his fist. Crash, perhaps, was his best friend in the fleet, but Kit was like a brother. He'd been his co-pilot and gunner for over a year. They'd logged more time together than Jake had with anyone. Poe kept her finger on the trigger, firing burst after burst through the door while Jake glanced around the hangar bay. Now free of the strafing fire that had pinned them all down, the pilots and gunners left alive sprinted toward their fighters. Dozens of bodies littered the floor. After a minute or so, no one else seemed to be coming through the front entrance, and everyone alive appeared to be in their fighters. All right, there's no one manning the bay door to open them, so just blast the back wall. Maybe we can even take out a bunch of those bastards. Even before he finished the sentence, a torpedo shot out of the bow and blasted almost the entire rear wall backward, ripping it away from the hangar bay and into several dozen enemy soldiers. When the dust settled, Jake could see the enemy troop carrier in the debris, and a few soldiers huddled behind it. Take out the carrier, he said, and another torpedo leapt from the ship and into the other, which burst into a massive, fiery explosion. He didn't even see where the soldiers taking cover had been blasted to. He didn't care. He thumbed open the comm channel to his squad. Viper squad, shotgun. Is Commander Dippin' alive? No one responded immediately. I... I think I saw his body when I was running out here, Poe said quietly. Very well, Viper Squadron Shotgun, everyone on me. I'm assuming command until I hear otherwise. First priority, protect Eglin Base. When base is secure, proceed to our previous assignment. He wasn't even sure if the squad's second-in-command was alive, but he wasn't going to wait to find out. People were dying out there, good people. He gunned the engine, lifted the ship a meter off the ground, and shot through the hole in the back of the hangar, slamming into a fleeing enemy soldier for good measure. And he couldn't help but feel a ghoulish sense of pleasure as the unlucky man's body flew up and hit the front viewport before sliding away with growing wind resistance. Poe, uh, assess the tactical situation and divvy out orders. I'll concentrate on not getting us killed, he said. He smiled as she snapped into action, jabbing at the console and scanning the ground below. Her voice seemed transformed from earlier. Now confident, steady, and decisive, she barked out orders. 
Viper 3 and 4 lay down suppressing fire for Hornet and Jackal hangers. Vipers 10 and 12 take out those carriers about to land at the Wolf hangar and blast the ground troops already there. Vipers 9 and 8 secure Red hangar and Dryad hangars. Everyone else relieve the pressure on the frigate crews trying to board their ship. Shotgun and I'll take the fighters. He looked up at her with raised eyebrows. Uh, we'll take the fighters? All of them? There's got to be five up there at least. Can't handle the heat, stay out of the fire, shotgun. He couldn't tell from her face if she was joking or not, but a strafing burst of fire hitting the rear of the fighter focused his attention back on flying. Crash, on us. I need some backup in spite of Poe's confidence in me. Crash's voice crackled over the comm. You got Poe over there? Where the hell's Givens? He saw her eyes narrow. Down, he said. Kit, too. Looks like Poe has to settle for me. He paused, cocking his head at her. You're Grizzly, aren't you? He said, referring to her call sign. He'd heard it before over the comm, but he'd never associated the call sign with her name or her face. Viper's squad didn't spend a terribly large amount of time socializing as a group. He only somewhat remembered her face from a few briefings. Yes. She didn't blink as her fingers dashed across the terminal and her thumb squeezed the trigger. An unfortunate enemy fighter exploded in a fiery streak and crashed into the central courtyard of the base. Jake whistled. Oof, nice shooting, Grizzly. He pulled up hard on the controls and they shot straight into the air, then arced and fainted toward one enemy fighter before changing course and darting toward another. Poe easily picked them off, too. Jake had never flown with a gunner that could match his speed and adapt to his unpredictable flying, and he kind of hated her for it, like he would be betraying his late friend by appreciating her skill. The image of Kit slumped against the wall forced its way into his mind, and he shook his head to be rid of it. Crash shouted over the comm. Nice one, shotgun. I'm dizzy just watching you. But get a load of this. And out of the corner of his eye, he saw Viper 2 come to a dead stop, then plummet straight down before flipping, shooting away in the opposite direction she had been facing, coming up hard on the tail of a hapless enemy bogey which met a fiery end. Oh, yeah? Jake smiled. He loved his back and forth with Crash. Though with Kit as his gunner, he almost never won. But now... He felt a new confidence that permitted him to pull out all the stops, trying unorthodox maneuvers he was sure his old friend never would have tolerated. Poe kept up without batting an eyelash. It was made of tough cloth, apparently. He eyed her thin black eyes and black hair tied back in a no-nonsense bun. Her flight uniform was perfectly pressed, except for some stray blood from her pilot, and thin-rimmed elegant glasses hung on the bridge of her nose. She looked like a grandma, he thought, but like twenty years younger. He made a mental note to never, ever tell her that. You asleep? she asked. He turned back to the view screens. Nope, just planning out our next moves. We've got one bogey left. The other fighters have nearly secured their hangars and the other squadrons are starting to take off. We should move to our assignment. We've been trying to raise HQ on the comm, but we're being jammed. He shook his head. Sure, the Asian Republic tended to be slippery in foreign and military affairs, especially the Russian bloc, but he never would have guessed they'd launch an outright attack. What about Fleet HQ in Miami? Are they being hit? And uh, Dallas, Resistance Headquarters? He scanned her console, and then nodded. Yes, both uh, Miami and Dallas report they're under attack. No requests for assistance yet. She looked up. But there might be jamming there, too. According to Admiral Gutierrez's briefing, they still had perhaps twenty minutes before they could count on the arrival of the Imperial fleet. He ran a quick calculation on the console. There's a battle group stationed at Miami Spaceport that needs to get off the ground if we're going to have any chance at this thing, and another based in Dallas. We're about ten minutes from both. You thinking what I'm thinking? She bit her lip, then nodded. Jake thumbed open the comm to a wide-spectrum bandwidth hoping something would make it past the jamming. Viper Group, we're making a quick pit stop in Dallas before we patrol lower Earth orbit, make a hard ascent to the upper atmosphere, then gun to Texas and take out the Charlie there. Hornet Squad, do the same for Miami. Everyone else, head to your previous assignments and whoop some ass. 
He wondered about whether the Hornet squad leader was hearing him and wondering why a lieutenant was ordering him around, but he didn't stop to find out. Ready? He looked over at Poe. When you are. She inclined her head once, maintaining the same steely, grim expression that graced her face since they'd climbed into the fighter. He gunned the gravitic drive and they accelerated upward as fast as wind resistance would allow them. He wasn't sure, but he thought he could see the edges of the fighter start to glow a dull red from the compression of the wave front in front of the leading edges, and so he accelerated until they glowed bright red. Soon the glow disappeared, signaling to Jake that the atmosphere was rarefied enough to hightail it to Dallas. Reorienting the nose toward the west, the fighter shot away like a bullet, followed by thirteen other Viper Squad birds. Jake glanced at the ETA readout. Five minutes to Dallas. Plenty of time to get to know his new gunner. He knew he would feel more comfortable with her if they had talked to each other a little, and he wanted to help take her mind off of the harrowing experience in the hangar bay. So, he began, looking at the ring on her hand. Married? Was, she replied without elaboration. Was, so you're divorced? I'd rather not talk about that now if it's all the same to you. She studied her sensor readout and then punched a few buttons. We're past the jamming. Orbital listening posts are reporting the arrival of the fleet in sole orbit as of a half hour ago. The Helios Science Observatory is reporting direct visual contact of sixteen capital-sized ships and a swarm of smaller ships, but resolution is limited to this range. The sun is eight light minutes away, and the soul-to-earth gravitic shift requires uh, the average capital ship to charge its cap banks for about thirty to forty minutes. They could be here any second. She paused to think. They could already be here, for that matter. Understood. We are four minutes away from Dallas. As soon as we mop up there, we'll come back up to orbit. He held the controls steady, and she didn't say anything else. In spite of his adrenaline, he understood her need for silence. He still could not bring himself to think about Kit, or the bloody corpse of her former pilot, or the charred remains littering the crater Eglin base courtyard. She breathed in deep, as if preparing to plunge into frigid water. My husband was killed when the Imperials struck a resistance base in California two years ago. After he was gone, I had nothing left, so I joined the service. I was decent with sensors and console readouts, and I don't mind flying, so I became a space jock. Sorry, he said. Still, he thought it was strange she kept the ring on. Until it dawned on him, she probably didn't want some drunk schmuck in a bar hitting on her. And keeping the ring on was the easiest way to avoid that, short of carrying a loaded pistol and pointing it at the drunk schmucks who tried. How long were you married? Eight years. Kids? He knew, as the word came out of his mouth, that he should not have said it. Her jaw tightened. I told you I'd rather not talk about that right now if it's all the same to you, she repeated almost robotically. I'm sorry. He glanced at the ETA readout. Thirty seconds. You ready? She nodded once, her lips tightly pursed. Her voice was cold. Let's go give these bastards a fucking they'll never forget. And that's when Jake decided to never, ever cross Megan Poe. The Grizzly. Cold Grizzly. Contacts, multiple bogies, swarming downtown Dallas, she said. How's Resistance HQ? Looks mostly undamaged, but the battle group is struggling to break free from dock. The massive city started to come into view below them, and Jake could just make out the jumbled forest of skyscrapers and the ten-block square section that comprised Resistance headquarters. The ten tallest skyscrapers in this section served as the city's spaceport, and about a dozen frigates remained moored to the tops of the towers, with hundreds of smaller ones moored farther down. Dallas had burgeoned into one of the world's supercities, a vast cosmopolitan financial and defense powerhouse that eclipsed even New York City, London, and Buenos Aires, the gargantuan capital of the South American Republic. The mile-high skyscrapers stretched out to the distant horizon, 
not giving way to suburbs until well past thirty clicks from the city center. Okay, there they are, he said, eyeing the flurry of fighters swarming their frigates. Ready? Do you have to ask? She said with a straight face. Engaging. Be ready for some quick stops and starts, he warned. Show me what you've got, shotgun. And with that, he pushed the ship forward into a lightning-fast dive, then changed directions upward so fast it was as if they bounced on a pocket of air. He twisted the ship around 180 toward an enemy bogey, which Poe dispatched with ease. Next, she murmured. Jake was starting to like the cold grizzly. Out of his peripheral vision, he saw other viper birds swoop down on the targets, swarming the tops of the skyscrapers raking them with streaking red fire. Jake winced as he saw one of their own burst into flame and crash into the side of a building. It goes Viper 3, he said before murmuring under his breath. Sorry, bird's eye. Shotgun, orbital sensors indicate the arrival of the Imperial fleet. They're in high Earth orbit and closing. Estimated arrival to low Earth orbit in one minute. She scanned the console, picking at sensor readouts while simultaneously targeting stray bogies. Our boys are heading out to intercept. Fury, Washington, and the SAS Bolivar are engaging. The Ordinero, the Havoc, the Excalibur, the AAS Kumasi, all close behind. I didn't know the African Republic had joined up. The smaller battle groups are also moving to engage. That's going to be one hell of a battle. Yeah, Jake nodded. I sure hope Pritchard's got something else up his sleeve. Watch our right flank, she said, pointing to an enemy bird racing toward them. He stopped the ship in mid-air and plunged straight down, re-engaging forward motion while flipping the ship to point up. Poe's deadly accurate fingers took care of the rest. How are we doing down here? What's left? He said as he pushed the controls to dive toward another fighter. Over half done here. We've lost Vipers 3 and 8, and the frigates are starting to pull away. She glanced at her console. Looks like the bastards hit our ion beam cannon towers down here. That's probably the first thing they hit so they could have free run of the place. Railgun installations are down, too. They were thorough. Just a handful of gigawatt laser cannons left for regional defense. Let's hope none of those heavy cruisers comes and parks over Dallas. Indeed. Okay, last few bogies. They're not falling back, though. Looks like they knew it was a one-way trip. Crash, you got that piercer on your port? he said. Yeah, I see it. Let me know if you need... Pose, shouting, caught him by surprise. She hadn't yet raised her voice the entire time. Nuclear contact! Where? He scanned his console, but couldn't make out where it was coming from. M multiple targets. Six hundred clicks up and falling fast. How many? The blood drained from her face. How many, Poe? Thirty-six, she said. Looks like one of our battle groups is moving to intercept and neutralize there. They're laying down a defensive screen. Jake thumbed the comm. All Viper squad, move immediately to intercept incoming nuclear signals. He pulled the nose up and rammed hard on the accelerator. The comm crackled back an answer. This is Commander Roberts and N.A. South Command. Belay that order, Viper squad. Concentrate all defensive capabilities on the remaining laser cannons and rail guns. Let the ground defense take them out. Jake yelled into his headset. But, sir, there's thirty-six warheads headed straight for Dallas. We can each take out at least five or six. Negative. Reinforce ground defense, Viper Squad. Those are your orders. An explosion rocked the cabin as the strafing fire from an enemy fighter connected with them. Jake breathed a sigh of relief as he saw the other bird explode in a shower of debris, and Viper 2 plunged through the dissipating fireball. Oh, thanks, Crash. What is that, uh, two beers I owe you now? Three. Meet you at the laser cannons. Jake, Poe began. Thirteen warheads made it past the battle group. They're targeting downtown Dallas. We're going up there, he said. And without waiting to ask her, they shot upward, accelerating until the hard edges of the craft glowed red again. But, shotgun, that hit took out our weapons. We've got no teeth. All our weapons? Torpedoes, too? We've still got the torpedoes, but our launching mechanism is shot. He pressed on the accelerator. Mercer? He didn't reply, but he kept the nose pointed straight up. Mercer, what exactly are you planning to do? I don't like to lose, Grizzly. She pursed her lips and then glanced down at the console. 
NA South Command is ordering us back. Looks like they've taken out two more of them with the laser cannons. We'll make that three more. Oh, but they're coming in fast. Look, there's one now. He decelerated, and as the warhead approached, he pressed down hard on the nose, rocketing the ship back toward the ground, keeping pace with the falling missile. A sense of surreal wonder overcame him as he looked up through the top viewport and saw the markings on the narrow shaft of the warhead. What the hell do you think you're— It worked at the shipyards, he said, as he swiveled the ship so the rear thrusters pointed straight at the thing. Pressing two buttons and hitting the override, he fired both forward and aft thrusters simultaneously, baking the missile until it glowed red. It's breaking apart. There, firing mechanism and electronics are both destroyed, Poe announced. Excellent. And on to the next one, shall we? She grinned. The first time she had smiled since Jake had grabbed her wrist not half an hour ago. Onward it is. Ground defense has taken out four more. There's another one a few clicks straight up. On it, he said, and slowed their descent until the second warhead pulled even with them. Blasting it with their thrusters, Jake let out a war whoop and pushed the fighter around in a celebratory loop when the thing exploded. There, all taken care of except one. It's way below us. Ground crews are firing at it, railguns, but no lasers. They must be recharging. Railguns, firing, firing. They can't seem to nail this one. It's a lot harder to hit a moving target with a railgun than a laser, Jake offered. She scowled. You think I don't know that? They studied the console. It's twenty clicks above the ground now. Still firing. She looked up at him. The blood drained from her face. He looked out the window before suddenly remembering what a foolish thing that was. He clapped his hands over his eyes, and he could hear Poe follow suit. And none too soon. For the second time in less than twelve hours, Jake saw the red of blood vessels in his hand filter the piercing, deadly shine of a nuclear blast. Get us out of here, Mercer, Poe's voice croaked. He opened his eyes and gunned the engine, unable to even look down at the developing mushroom cloud that rapidly swirled upward. It was five hundred megatons, she said in a near whisper. She studied the readout. She seemed unable to bring herself to look down. The wave front is dissipating around the twenty-kilometer mark. She paused. Downtown is gone. The calm crackled to life on the wide band. This is United Earth Prime Minister Radovan Hawkins. To our Corsican Empire and United Earth ships, the United Governments of Earth hereby offer our unconditional surrender. All Earth units are ordered to, to stand down. The voice paused. Please, please, for God's sake. Have some human decency. Have mercy. Jake, still numb inside, looked down. Finally, where the sprawling metropolis once stood was replaced by a blackened, fiery wasteland. The center of the circle was empty of anything recognizable, followed by standing skeletons of skyscrapers a little further out, blazing like gargantuan torches. The outer city and suburbs blazed like a fireball as well, until at the outer edges of the circle the blast wave front had flattened some houses, but caught little on fire. But he knew that the thousands of people in that outer zone would eventually succumb to radiation poisoning in a few days. Are they going to leave us like Belen? He couldn't help but think about the world that the Empire had destroyed over a hundred years ago, nuked it to complete oblivion. Nothing like it had happened since then, as the Imperial Senate severely chastised the Emperor responsible for the genocide, but the example had always haunted the thoughts of all worlds that opposed the Empire. Nobody wanted to be the next Belen. Dunno, shotgun. The fury just shifted away, destination unknown, said Poe. He glanced over at her, a single tear wet her cheek, which she wiped away with her sleeve. The rest of the fleet is standing down. We are receiving instructions from Eglin to return to base. Her eyes met his. It's over, Mercer. The Empire won. 
I always win. No, he whispered. Thoughts of the decades he could spend in prison flashed through his mind. By all accounts, the Corsicans were not kind to their prisoners, and Jake began contemplating pointing the nose of the fighter away from Earth and making a gravitic shift to Mars or one of the Jovian moons. He could escape there, blend in with the population, hide out until the resistance rose again. Take us back, she said in an almost robotic voice. Time to face the music. A cold knot formed in his stomach, which only grew over the flight back to the Florida panhandle. Dad gives up. Not me. Not me, damn it. He glanced up through the top viewport in the cabin. Poe caught his eye. Don't, she said. Don't run. Don't even think about it. They'll catch you, and when they do, they'll torture you, then execute you, and me. Just don't, she repeated. Why not? She set her jaw, locked her cold, steely eyes on his. Because? When I held the charred bodies of my children in my arms as they took their last gasp, I swore, I swore, I swore, she said with rising intensity, that I'd make the Empire pay, that I'd make them suffer, that I'd bring the battle back to Corsica itself and obliterate the Empire. And me hanging by a noose now means fewer dead Corsicans later. He looked back to the controls. A smoking crater that marked Dallas's passing started to sink below the horizon behind them, and Jake furiously pounded once on the dashboard, cracking the casing. I always win. But not today, he breathed. Three. Three years later. Admiral Trajan? The graying, rail-thin officer poked his head through the ready-room door. He hated disturbing the men, especially at breakfast. He made a mental note to have his XO do the honors next time. Admiral? he repeated. Do come in, Captain, a voice from the chair in the center of the room said. Captain Titus of the Corsican battleship NPQR Caligula stepped through the door and started to walk toward the chair when the voice interrupted him. Close it, please. A sonorous husky voice said. Titus pulled the handle and shut the door, standing at attention. He'd learned months ago not to speak out of turn with the new admiral. New not as an admiral, but new aboard the Caligula. The Imperial Fleet Command had transferred Admiral Trajan to the Caligula's battle group recently, and so far Trajan had not revealed his true purpose aboard, which ostensibly remained highly classified. Captain Titus looked around his old ready room, Unfortunately, Admiral Trajan had converted it into makeshift quarters. A mat lay spread against the wall behind the desk, without so much as a pillow or blanket to suggest that it was, in fact, the man's bed. Very few personal belongings cluttered the space, except for the wall, which now displayed a variety of musical instruments. A violin, a trumpet, several exotic-looking wind instruments that Titus could not immediately identify— and one pair of horns that looked deceptively like blowpipes hung crossing one another like an old-style skull and crossbones. Do you like heavy metal, Captain? the Admiral asked, without turning his chair around to face him, which was fine with Titus. He still loathed looking at the Admiral's face, as did most of the crew. Uh, sir? Like tungsten? No, Captain, like the music. Captain Titus shook his head. I'm sorry, sir, I'm afraid I've never heard it. Up until that point, he hadn't been aware of a barely audible, screeching noise that permeated the room. At first, it seemed to him just background noise of the ship or the work of some mechanic one deck above or below. Admiral Trajan motioned with his finger, which the computer assistant understood as an increase in volume. Captain Titus clamped his hands over his ears as a cacophony of pounding sounds blasted his head. Hardly music. The clashes and screeches made his head pound, and he winced. Half a minute went by, and Titus considered bolting from the room, wondering how long he might have to spend in the brig for the deed. Thankfully, a raised finger from Trajan decreased the volume to a tolerable level. Isn't it magnificent, Titus? 
the captain hesitated. He wasn't sure what Trajan was expecting him to say. In the Corsican Empire fleet, one gave the answer his superior expected, or there were consequences. It is certainly... interesting, Admiral. Please, Captain, your true feelings, I will not be offended, I assure you. He hesitated again, unsure of whether to take the Admiral at face value. But the Admiral's sigh interrupted his ambivalence. I'll speak your thoughts for you, Captain. How could this be music, you're thinking? What riffraff would even think of listening to this garbage for leisure, for fun? It's like listening to two cargo freighters attempting to make love to each other. Captain Titus couldn't help but smile at the disturbing imagery. These are the dulcet warblings of a late twenty-first century band called the Sweet Nothings, quite popular in their day back on earth. Perhaps even our own ancestors thrashed their heads along to the music as they operated the machines that churned out the myriad of plastic commercial trappings that made life worthwhile back then. He laughed. Well, maybe not my ancestors. Mine were too busy infiltrating the Italian government at the time. Yours too, perhaps. The Admiral's back was still turned to Captain Titus, but now he swiveled the chair to face him. Over time, Titus had learned not to wince. His former XO had not learned that lesson, and the Admiral's response was uncharitable. His eye, his right eye, it was missing, just gone. And worse, the Admiral made no attempt to cover it up, giving no thought to the comfort of those around him. Ah, except that was the brilliant strategy of Trajan's that Titus had finally understood. It wasn't that the Admiral had no concern for the comfort of those around him. It was merely that he was entirely concerned with the emotional state of those around him. The more discomfort he could incite in whoever he was issuing commands to or negotiating with, the better. He was a master of controlling the situation around himself, and Titus guessed the gaping hole in his head, mottled with veins and scar tissue was exposed to the world precisely as just another tool to assist him in his control of others. Captain, the Admiral began, locking his remaining black eye on the man. Titus shifted uncomfortably on his feet. Do you realize you can tell everything there is to know about a people by its music? Their aspirations, their fears, their thought processes and outlook on life, how they process information, how they value beauty and handle suffering and pain even how they formulate strategy and, dare I think it, battle plans. Not details, of course, but broad narrative arcs. It was posed as a question, but Titus had interacted with Trajan long enough to know not to answer. The answer would be given to him at the appropriate time. Did you know that a culture's music is the window to its very soul? Tell me, Captain, what does this music tell you about the soul of those who enjoy it? Uh, chaotic? Uh, unbalanced? The Admiral frowned. Are you certain? Titus swallowed. No, sir. Admiral Trajan pulled a comb out of his pocket and ran it through his thick black hair, which still showed the gleam of some type of oil-based product. Unbalanced? No, Captain. You might not be aware, but this is the music of the Rebellion. Every rebel fighter listens to it. Every space jock has it ringing through his fighter's cabin as he flies. Even Admiral Pritchard himself, before he disappeared, was known to have a fondness for it. And his men adored him. Pritchard. The Empire's scouts had searched the subtle part of the galaxy for two years, and still hadn't found the bastard. Where you hid a battleship the size of the Fury was beyond Captain Titus. He nodded in response to the Admiral's monologue. The Admiral continued the age lines on his face, stretching as he smiled. And what it tells me about the rebellion is that it is not dead. They will rise again, and will choose their moment soon if I have a correct read on them. He dropped his chin and glanced at Titus. Which I assure you, I do. Titus protested. The Earth rebellion rise again? But they are finished— they have no political organization, their military ranks have been absorbed into the Imperial fleet. What about the truth and reconciliation process? Mm, the Senate, 
may have forced us into reconciliation with the rebels after the Dallas incident. But that doesn't mean the rebels just went away. No, Captain, they are not finished. They are simmering just below the surface. They know a watched pot never boils, and so they are lying low, waiting until we are looking elsewhere. But they will choose their moment, and we will be ready. Titus nodded. Yes, sir. And so that is the nature of your mission? To wait for them to make their move and then to crush them? The Admiral had been on board for three months, sending out a constant stream of communication through gravitic pods and directing the Caligula's course from the privacy of the captain's ready room, which he had transformed into his command center in addition to his quarters. The chair swiveled back around to face the view screen, and Titus breathed a silent sigh of relief that he didn't have to stare at the gaping hole in his face any more. You're half right, Captain. We will not wait for them to make their move. We will, in fact, encourage them to take it. We will set it on a gold platter and decorate it and entice them to bite. And when they do, yes, we will crush them. He keyed the display on the wall in front of him, and it snapped to life. Why, I called you here, he said, tapping the screen, indicating a stellar map of the galaxy within fifty light-years of Earth. Titus looked at the readout and cocked his head. Epsilon Aradani? Well, there are no major habitable planets there, just a, a mining settlement. Yes. And a valuable member state of the Empire, however small its size. We need to go there, have navigation plot a course. But, uh, sir, Titus squirmed a bit, why do we need to go to a mining settlement, and especially one inhabited by the lowest forms of life in this sector of the galaxy? Smugglers, bounty hunters, pirates, slavers, you name it, Epsilon Eridani has it all, Admiral Trajan replied without looking up, for which Captain Titus was grateful. You will know the reason eventually. Get us there within the day. His tone indicated that the conversation had finished. Titus drew himself up to his full height and saluted before turning on his heel. Oh, and Captain. Titus paused at the door and turned to face the thin, black-haired man in the chair, who swiveled once more toward him, aiming the ghastly, empty eye-hole his direction again. Convert one of the fighter bays into storage space. We are about to receive a large quantity of goods, and we will need a place to put them. Uh, but what about the fighters? If the bay is full of goods, we will lose fighter launch capability. Yes, I know that. Move them off to the side. Send them to the other bay, I don't care. We will have to do without them for up to a week. Dismissed. Titus had a dozen more questions for the Admiral. Why in the hell they were relinquishing fighter support for a week, chief among them? And what exactly was so important that it required one of the most advanced battleships in the Corsican Imperial fleet to play the role of a common freighter? but he saluted again and closed the door firmly behind him, listening as the screeching music shifted to something even more ghastly than before and at a much higher volume. This was going to be an interesting year, to say the least. Shotgun, don't do it. Lieutenant Commander Jacob Mercer lifted the visor of his helmet and glanced back at Poe. And why not? Because if you die, then I'll have to scrape the goo off the canyon floor, and Admiral Bates will demote me back to lieutenant. She threaded the strap from her motorcycle helmet's C-ring and pulled it off her head, shaking her long black hair in the breeze flowing up from the canyon's edge. Jake noted with approval that at least she let the bun out when not on duty, a marked improvement he had suggested months before. Yeah, listen to Mama Grizzly said their companion, Ben Jemez, perched atop a third high CC motorcycle. Besides, I'm sure it's against a dozen fleet regulations. You know the Imperials. They've got rules against blowing your nose with toilet paper rather than tissues. Jake wrenched his own helmet off and glared back at his friend. Yeah? Well, which one? He and Ben had been friends for nearly three years now, and Jake had gotten quite good at calling the other man's bluff, especially when he was quoting regulations. Oh, uh, you know... In the back, man. Uh, section 401, paragraph C or something? He waved his hand vaguely. The section that says no risking your life to prove yourself to people you've already proven yourself to? Listen to the boy, Jake. He's wise beyond his years, said Poe. Lieutenant Commander Ben Jemez was only seven years younger than Poe, and only four years younger than Jake, 
but Poe had adopted him after her fashion, doting on him as he had no living parents of his own, one unfortunate drawback to being from Dallas. Yeah, listen to the boy, Ben repeated, grinning. It's only a risk if you think there's a chance of failure, Jake retorted, then turned to look at the canyon. It was small, as canyons went in the deserts of the inland empire of Southern California, more of a deep, dry riverbed than a canyon. And yet, a good three hundred feet of dusty desert air hung between the two walls, and the canyon floor seemed like a distant pile of sand a hundred feet down. As they'd raced down the highway, one particular slope next to the canyon had beckoned to him. He'd stopped, examined it, and his onboard computer informed him that the slope was precisely 24.2 degrees, and that if he gunned it up to 115 miles per hour, he'd barely make it, not accounting for wind resistance, of course. If you don't think there's a chance of failure, then you're even more deluded than I thought, quipped Poe. Ben filled with his helmet. Tell you what, shotgun. You make it over, you can have the bike. If you don't, you buy me a new one, deal? Jake could tell he was just angling for a new motorcycle, but that he had every expectation his friend would back down at the last second, as he had done twice earlier in the day at smaller ravines. Revving the engine a few times, he breathed in the smell of the exhaust of the retro throwback. Based on models of late 21st century sport bikes, the 27th century versions featured microgravitic thrusters, which not only improved the gas mileage to over a thousand miles per gallon, but also increased the maximum speed to well over what humans should sensibly travel over pavement. But at least the microgravitics would provide a modicum of safe deceleration in the event of a crash. At least he hoped they would. The onboard computer had been acting finicky. It was a 20-year-old bike, after all. I'm wearing an ASA suit, for heaven's sake, Grizz. Not like I'm going to die if I fall, and there's the gravitic deceleration, and there's the... He continued listing off the safety features, more for his sake than Poe's. Look, if you're going to go, go, it's your funeral. Poe had a habit of passive aggressiveness when it came to the safety of others. It had served her well as Jake's co-pilot and gunner for two years, and now as a fighter squad leader herself. He'd threatened to jump at two previous, smaller canyons, but this time Jake grit his teeth and made up his mind. Okay, here I go. See you on the other side. Before he could change his mind, he gunned the engine, revving it up to well past 20,000 RPM, eyeing the old-school speedometer as he raced up the incline he hunched over, preparing himself to jerk the handles up slightly to counteract the change in slope at the top. 150, 170. The wind buffeted his sleek red helmet and gleaming red ASA suit, armor that could repel a plasma RPG at point-blank range. 175, and... lift off. He soared high into the air, feeling as free as he did while in his fighter, his trusty old bird. In his speaker set he could hear Poe and Ben chatter, but in his altered consciousness he couldn't tell what they were saying. All he could feel was freedom. Freedom and weightlessness, the two best feelings in the world. Though a brief flashback to a certain woman's restroom mirror reminded him of a third. An unexpected blast of wind slammed into him laterally, introducing a slight rotation to his flight. He thumbed the stabilizer and the gravitics kicked in to right his descent, but out of the blue the wind shifted and blasted him the other direction, knocking his right arm loose, and when he grabbed the handle again he inadvertently hit the lateral stabilizer, the same direction as before, sending him into a lateral spin. Well, shit, was the last thing he said before colliding with the top of the opposite canyon wall and blacking out. They watched as Jacob Mercer tumbled through the air and slammed into the wall on the other side, and plummeted down the steep, vertical slope to the dry riverbed below. Poe's hands darted over the tiny console perched on the handlebars of her bike, eyes wide in horror. She cupped her hand over her mouth. Is he... Ah, uh, man, tell me he's okay, Ben murmured. She breathed a sigh of relief. He's alive. The gravitics kicked in before the collision and blunted the impact and slowed his fall down the wall to, I'm reading a steady life sign. She looked up at him. No such luck for the bike. Damn it! Ben pounded the top of the gas tank. Hey, at least you get a new bike out of it. Ben looked at her askance. You really think he's gonna pay up? He hasn't got that kind of money. His old man spends it all on booze. He took off his helmet and ran his fingers through close-cut brown hair, 
perfectly styled despite two hours crammed in a helmet, paused a moment, then pounded the gas tank again. Damn it! Poe studied her readout. Hey, if it's any consolation, he broke at least one bone, she offered helpfully. He sighed. I suppose we have to go down there and get him. Ben Jemez had met Jacob Mercer in the aftermath of Dallas three years ago. The Imperial Senate was in an uproar and demanded that the Imperial fleet stand down, implementing a process of truth and reconciliation, which included a formal amnesty to all but the top political and military leaders of the resistance. Ben, having lost his parents in the blast, joined the resistance, now underground, and was encouraged to join the Imperial fleet, where he met Mercer and Poe. They took him under their wings, and soon he'd surpassed all but the best and brightest in skill, leadership qualities, and his ability to memorize chapter and verse of the regulation manual, the tech manuals of every fighter and cruiser, and just about any other spec sheet or instruction book. By all accounts, he was slated to make captain by thirty. Don't look so depressed. He did pull your ass out of that bar fight last week, remember? Poe glanced back at the console and sent out a signal for help from the base out in San Bernardino. Yeah, a bar fight that he started. What business was